Uh, pleased to have a special session today. Um, and just a note in advance, thanks to the folks who were uh, flexible enough to, to, change, to accommodate a little bit of a change in schedule. Um, so today we have our annual state of the division with um, our division head, Dr. Raj Marotra. And I'll turn it right over to you, Raj. Thank you, Kate. Uh, let me just... Uh... just doing it. Can you see my screen now? That looks good. We're on the disclosures slide and the yeah. first slide. That's good. All thanks. right. Thanks, Kate, for having me. Uh, and thanks to everyone that uh, changed schedules to accommodate unexpected events. So my goal here is to present in where we are, when the, where have we been in the division of nephrology? Uh, where are we now? And where are we headed? Um, just as disclosures, I'm the editor in chief of C. Jason. You will see me shamelessly uh, showing stuff from C. Jason. So uh, appreciate your understanding. There are other journals out there too, but uh, I know what's in C. Jason. Uh, I'm the president elect for ISPD, chair of the board of trustees of NKC, and a consultant for Lightline. Uh, not much of which are going to relate to much of these things. So. Uh, we, next year will be an important milestone in the Department of Medicine at the University of Washington. We are a relatively young university, a young school of medicine, and a young department of medicine relative to other high-profile departments in the country. Um, the Department of Medicine was actually established in 1948, and the first de department chair uh, was Robert Williams. So next year will be 75 years. At that time, there were only four divisions in the department, and nephrology was not one of them. Nephrology didn't get established as a division up until 10 years later. So next year will be actually 65 years for the division of nephrology. As a part of the 75-year celebration, the department asked us to reflect on five people uh, that actually have made the most contributions uh, to the division as the division is today. Uh, and it is not a surprise that the first person to start off would be Belding Scribner. Uh, it is his work that made not only long-term hemodialysis, but also long-term peritoneal dialysis possible. After all, the Tenkoff catheter was introduced by Tenkoff working under Belding Scribner. The next person would be Bill Kauser. You know, Bill Kauser, uh, many of you may know him, uh, but I think he is the one who firmly established the foundation of biomedical research within nephrology at the University of Washington. A shout out to Stuart Shanklin, you know, the division as it stands today is to all the work that Stuart had done in 16 years as division head, but in, in nearly 30 years that he's been at the University of Washington. And I think the strongest partnership that he built was with Joyce Jackson as the CEO of the Northwest Kidney Center is that supported the establishment of the Kidney Research Institute, supported a fellowship program, supported our Center for Dialysis Innovation, and all of the work that Jonathan has done in establishing all the research that is done at the University of Washington. So I have actually no doubt that these five individuals have contributed over the span of 65 years to where the division is today, uh, and, and we owe them a lot of gratitude. So now we're convening after two years. Uh, it is, uh, you know, last year we didn't have a talk such as this in part because uh, we had an active search on for division head and I was a candidate and I did not feel it was an appropriate forum for me to be uh, appropriating to make that presentation. So it's two years. So some of the stuff that I'll be presenting uh, would be over a span of two years rather than the last one year. And the reason in part also, you know, why is this by Zoom, why we had to postpone uh, my presentation by two weeks is because of COVID. Uh, it's unremitting. It is uh, even today, if you look at there, nearly 50,000 Americans uh, that are getting COVID every day. Uh, it is unimaginable that it's over two years that we've been, we've been living with COVID pandemic. The Division of Nephrology actually was a very active contributor to a lot of the early guidance that came out that was largely opinion based, but was necessary to actually for the practice of nephrology. Uh, and as you can see, the volume of publications by so many individuals 
uh, that that came out that was important in us dealing with the pandemic head on two years ago. We have continued to contribute to the science of COVID, both in the both at on the bench as well as uh, at the bedside and using large data, starting off with the work that Bino has done in kidney organoids uh, in terms of how SARS-CoV-2 infects kidney cells. Uh, there is work that has been done. Uh, the second paper that I'm, that I'm showing here is with Brian and Leela and others within the division uh, in terms of the effect of the inflammatory response in the setting of AKI. Uh, and then, uh, the clinical pathologic correlation in terms of AKI led by Brandon and Iris, along with our pathology colleagues uh, that are instrumental in educating us has been very influential in us understanding the pathophysiology of AKI in the setting of COVID. But that's not it. Uh, you know, even though we are not seeing as much in acute illness with people in the ICU from COVID, the effect of COVID has persisted. Um, no place exemplifies this more than at Harborview, uh, where there's been unprecedented number of hospitalized patients. Uh, and it is in part because of deferred care. It is also because of substantial delays in placing patients in SNFs and in outpatient dialysis unit. And then one of the, you know, I remember the early conversations when we talked about whether or not we had enough equipment to provide care. We didn't have shortage of equipment, we had shortage of people. Uh, people getting COVID, people getting burnt out, people leaving. Uh, and that has been the greatest shortage that we've experienced acutely, particularly at Herberview. Just to exemplify that, for years, Herberview provides about 3,000 dialysis treatments every year. That has been, as you can see, for the last six years, has been about 3,000 treatments. This past year, it's almost 6,000 treatments. That's twice as many. So the volume is staggering, such that Harborview had to add a second attending only service added. Um, and I just wanna acknowledge the strong work that Leah did as interim section head, but also Sarah that was up, up until like 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, just managing uh, the logistics of providing dialysis to people in the hospital. Um, so this has been a very difficult this continues to be a very difficult time past just the implications from acute illness um, that we've uh, we experienced early on in the pandemic. We are not alone. Uh, this is from the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, just illustrating the percentage of hospitals reporting critical staffing shortages. And as you can see, in January of this year, um, 15 to 30 percent of hospitals in the state of Washington we're reporting critical staffing shortages. And that's nas nationwide. There are, nation there are states that are reporting between 31 to 50% and here between 50 to 100%. So the staffing shortage is profound and is nationwide. It is not surprising that this is contributing to substantial amounts of stress, anxiety, frustration, burnout, people feeling overwhelmed. These are surveys of healthcare providers nationwide, again, from the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and confounding with, compounding all of this was uh, like 18 months ago, I forget now when that was, we had a national CRRT solution shortage. And so we had such high volumes and yet not certain whether we could provide CRRT. And there's been substantial moral distress when making dialysis care decisions. So I wanna start my presentation by acknowledging that all that we have been going through. I mean, our diet leaders from both Harborview and at Montlake uh, engaged, so it's Sarah and Naomi and Carrie and um, Nancy, uh, engaged with the National Northwest Healthcare Response Network periodically to look at this issue from a regional perspective rather than an institutional perspective. Uh, a special shout out to Kate, you know, Kate is experienced. She she brings an ethical lens uh, to her care, uh, and a lot of her research focus is on navigating healthcare decisions when healthcare resources are scarce. Um, and so she has been an important voice in supporting and navigating all of this. And she's generated a lot of important scholarly work uh, that is that essentially this is not necessarily from our region but nationwide 
in terms of what are the clinician's experience and perspectives when navigating these resource limitations. So this is an important part. So, so aid has been an important part of the national conversation in navigating um, this healthcare crisis that our industry is face, facing nationwide. I, the VA has an extraordinary rich data set that can be readily leveraged, more readily leveraged than at any um, healthcare system. And Anne has been a part of the team at the Puget Sound VA that has generated just high impact science in terms of population level experiences with, uh, with SARS-CoV-2 infection nationwide in population of veterans. And just as you can see, the journals in which the work has been published and the quality of the work and the importance of work uh, is extraordinary. Uh, and then Bilal has been a part of the Stop COVID Investigators Consortium that has been extremely influential in generating a lot of the data uh, particularly as it relates to AKI and critically ill people with COVID-19. Um, so we have contributed, we have navigated extremely difficult times. When doing so, we have continued to contribute scholarly work that has informed the management of the pandemic, and that is consistent with our academic mission that we have at the University of Washington. There are changes that have been that have been a result of the COVID-19 pandemic that are here to stay. Um, and I, I'm just gonna point out four of them. Uh, the first is that telehealth is now routine. Across the three sites, Montlake, Harborview, and at the VA, we are doing over 300 telehealth visits every month. As you can see, this, this dark light blue, the dark blue is Harborview, this orange is a Montlake General Nephrology, this gray is pre-transplant evals, this um, color is post-kidney, and this light blue is the VA. And this is this, of course, this peak in December and January and February was when the clinic got flooded and the clinic was closed at Montlake, and that is just another thing that is adding to the stressors. But telehealth is now routine, and I, I am certain that telehealth is not going away uh, as a way. Right now, we are, we are delivering telehealth as a part of the public health emergency, um, there has been legislation that has passed the U.S. House that is waiting passage through the U.S. Senate that will codify some of the availability of telehealth that we have now taken for granted. The pushback, if telehealth is taken away, the pushback is going to come more from the patients than from the physicians. Uh, and so I think it's here to stay. We are in the, uh, in the middle of a recruitment season for a fellowship program. It's the third year, I think, that we are recruiting virtually. It seems mostly now the way the world of fellowship programs is, not just fellowship programs, it's residency and medical school, uh, everything that is, all the interviews are now virtual. Uh, and I, I don't think that's going to go away because there is such tremendous cost savings to the trainees um, when recruitment is virtual rather than for it to be in person. Remote work, I mean, like, you know, it's, uh, you know, right now there's only Carrie Payne right down the hallway. There's nobody else in the office. Um, and that is gonna be, uh, that is gonna be the way of the future. I, I don't think we're getting back to full offices the way it used to be. Uh, and uh, part of the work that'll need to be done is to rethink the workspaces and office allocation. Um, and finally, virtual conferences and meetings, like, you know, like here we are in person uh, by Zoom, you know, we were supposed to convene for the first time two weeks ago, then I got COVID. Uh, so that was not to be, um, but this year we'll have selected in-person nephrology grand rounds where we'll rotate sites, but a large number of our conferences and meetings at UW within nephrology, outside nephrology, and nationwide will remain virtual. So these are changes from the pandemic that are here to stay. Moving right along, you know, one of the things, there are advantages to this. I just got this uh, message from Krista yesterday. Uh, so as you know, we record Grand Rounds. We upload them to the cloud. We make it available publicly. Uh, this is the Grand Round that has gone viral. Uh, this is from Raymond Pitchler from earlier this year. Um, this has been viewed over 52,000 times. Um, so there are advantages that exist when we, from the changes that we have made 
as a result of the pandemic such that um, the content of what we present is much more widely available than people that are physically here at this time. Moving right along, I, I just want to then uh, switch gears talking about uh, Grand Rounds. Um, I want to thank Matt, who uh, led the Grand Round um, Grand Rounds for six years and made a lot of innovative changes. Uh, I want to welcome Kate. Uh, she has worked hard to put on the schedule and navigate, uh, most importantly, the different working with the sites and where the in-person Grand Rounds would be. Uh, and as importantly, uh, we're going to be starting a visiting professors program. And we have four visiting professors that are coming in this year. Uh, and Kate has been working to coordinate that. Uh, so the first person that's going to visit us in November is going to be Rachel Padzer from Emory. Uh, she's an amazing investigator that works in disparities in kidney transplantation. Um, we'll have Samir Parekh. He's the division head at UT Southwestern. He'll be coming in May of next year. So these will be two per people that will be visiting us in person. And, and we'll have Rashida Hall and Biff Palmer joining us by Zoom. Um, so exciting times. We are starting with two in person, two by Zoom this year. We'll see how the response is uh, and we'll look how to modify that in the years moving forward. So we welcome your feedback and how these visiting professor programs go. We welcome suggestions for who we should be inviting um, from within your areas of expertise uh, and, and that'll be imp incredibly important. This is also a time of tremendous change. Um, uh, you know, Jonathan had been the director of the Kidney Research Institute for 14 years. And uh, as you know, recently, Ian took over as the director of the KRI. Uh, I, I just want to acknowledge the tremendous impact Jonathan has had on the Division of Nephrology at the University of Washington. Uh, it is not an understatement for it. it he catalyzed kidney disease related research across various divisions and departments in the School of Medicine, and not just the School of Medicine between different schools. In his, over his term, the KRI investigators procured over $200 million in extramural funding, primarily federal. Collectively enrolled over 8,000 participants in registries and clinical studies, uh, generated over 1,500 research publications. Uh, and we've been recognized internationally for excellence in kidney disease related research. Um, he's been recognized nationally and internationally for the, his contributions. Uh, this year he got the Belding Scribner Lifetime Achievement Award. He's actually the third divisional faculty to receive Lifetime Achievement Award from the ASN, uh, the other two being Belding Scribner and Bill Kauser. He got the Don Selden Award from the NKF. He was the president of ASN. And he got the Mike Lazarus lectureship from the NKF in 2012. And Jonathan is not going anywhere. Like he's, he's keeping very busy. He remains the co-director of the Center for Dialysis Innovation. He is the contact PI for the central hub for the KPMP. Uh, and he is doing trials on kidney on a chip. Um, highly innovative work that is going to be influential on our field and within our institution for decades to come. Um, I want to welcome Marissa. All of you know Marissa. I was just thrilled when she chose to apply for the position and was selected. Uh, I couldn't do what I do without Marissa's support, so thank you, Marissa. We have had four new staff members. Shannon is uh, a fiscal specialist. Danielle uh, has been an administrative uh, uh, assistant, but she's now also the interim um, coordinator for the fellowship program, and I'll talk more about that. Maureen as the HR manager, and uh, Jessica as the grants manager. So I want to welcome all of them. Uh, and then this is the grants team. This is the entire administrative team within the division uh, that is just incredibly important that allows us to do the work that we do as readily as we do. A special shout out to Krista. She has worked extremely hard all through the summer to come up with this new divisional website. Um, and, and I. I've, I encourage you to do two things. First, just spend time on the website, but as importantly, provide feedback to Krista. She cannot update the content without your input. Uh, as it pertains to you, as, per, as it pertains to the programs you oversee, please let Krista know for her to be able to update the content. 
we've had five new faculty in the two years uh, since we last met. Monica joined. Uh, Monica is a physician assistant in the dialysis program. She joined uh, us in February of 2021. Uh, Jessica joined the transplant uh, team as an APP in October uh, of 2021. Kate uh, joined as faculty in April of 2022. Uh, thrilled to have Kate here. She was actually uh, recruited heavily from outside UW, so I'm glad she decided to stay on. Um, Daniel, third, third time is the charm. We wanted him as a fellow, then we wanted him as a transplant fellow. Uh, now we get him as a faculty. So he's just started August 15th uh, and thrilled to have Laura stay on with us as well. Uh, she also had multiple offers from within the community, uh, heavily recruited from within the community. So welcome all of you uh, to the division. We have uh, other new members of the family. Uh, ben and Katie, welcome Taryn in June of 2021. Uh, Carrie and Gretchen, welcome Madison. Uh, Amol and Shriya, welcome Gia. And Neha and Akshay, welcome Arjun. Uh, important, important members of the UW nephrology family. Uh, so welcome all. Uh, at this point, just want to transition and, and just recognize the tremendous contributions of Chris Blagg uh, he was a nephrologist from Leeds in the UK that decided to come to Seattle to work with Belding Scribner uh, was instrument was the first actually it, it was not he was not called the CEO but the first leader of the Northwest Kidney Centers uh, and led it for what 26 years or so passed away earlier this year. Um, the other person I want to acknowledge who passed away was Nancy Spaeth. Uh, Nancy was actually selected as a patient by the selection committee. It was a surprise that Nancy was selected when she was selected. She was in high school, had lupus nephritis, had kidney failure, was not the demographic that would have been selected, that would, would have been a young white man uh, employed with family. She was not that demographic. And so she was the longest living person with kidney failure alive when she passed around the world. Nobody had lived as long with kidney failure as Nancy did. Single mother raised kids um, and a very loud patient advocate. So she passed away early this year as well. <clears throat> Moving on to celebrations, uh, we've had promotions. Uh, Nisha was promoted to professor. We've had four people promoted to associate professor, um, uh, Matt, Leela, Su Susan, and uh, Carrie. And then recognizing Suzanne, uh, who's the distinguished, who got the ASN Distinguished Leader Award. She's the second faculty from within the division um, to, get, to, to get one of these distinguished awards from the ASN, Nisha being the one prior one. Uh, congratulations, Suzanne, for that. Just a word on divisional endowments. You know, endowments are important. Um, we have limited sources of funding. At some point, we'll talk about that. Endowments is an important source of funding. Um, and uh, of course, this is not a good time to look at the balance of the endowments. They're all in the dumps, just like all other investments are. Uh, actually, early these early this year is like ten million dollars. The last time I checked, it was nine and a half million dollars. So they're going down. But be as it may, uh, we have divisional endowments, and we are happy to say uh, that Ian is the new holder of the Joe Ashbach Endowed Chair in, nephro in nephrology research. Um, Brian is the new holder of the David and S. Anida Otterberg Professor. Uh, and Anne is the new holder of the Bill Peckham Endowed Fund in Person-Centered Care. For the first time, we have an endowed fund to support our fellows, uh, which, is, which was established in memory of Pat Fleet, uh, who was a longtime faculty member. And Lauren, uh, she's the chief fellow. She's the inaugural Fleet Fellow. Um, so this is an important source of support for our faculty as well as for our fellows. Uh, and I want to thank all of the donors that have donated over the years to make this possible. So what is our mission? Uh, you know, it's put simply, anything and everything we do, all our work is to improve the lives of patients with kidney diseases. Uh, and you can put it in any bucket, anyone that is working is working towards that end. And academic medicine has a tripartite mission. Uh, it is translational research and innovation. It is care for complex and underserved uh, populations and training our future physicians. Uh, each of these 
each of these missions is central to our success. Uh, I, I don't think one is more important than the other. Each of them is equally important. And for us to succeed, we have to succeed in all three. Um, and we were just really very proud of the way we are, just let's start with the research. In the two year period that since the last time we met, researchers within the division submitted 147 applications for grants and contracts. That resulted in $46 million in awards in the two year period. If you look at a snapshot, we have 13 members of the faculty that have a K, R, or equivalent grants from the NIH, including from the Department of Defense and the VA. We have one new K-23 award, we'll talk more about that. We have five investigators that are conducting industry-sponsored trials, uh, five research trainees that have received fellowship grants, and it spans the entire spectrum of kidney diseases and research types. And I'll talk more about it, uh, some of it more about it as we go along. One of the greatest recognitions young researchers can get is when they're admitted to the American Society of Clinical Investigation. Um, so it used to be called the Young Turks, who, who they are. Uh, and Nisha was admitted as a member of the ASCII earlier this year. And she joins two other people that have been admitted as members of the ASCII in the last 10 years. That's Ian and Brian. Uh, it is a distinct accomplishment and a testament to excellence in clinical research. We've had a lot of all the research that we do is possible because of the people other than the investigators that support the research. Um, a lot of you know John Rosinski. He was in the lab for a long time. He decided to take, he retired. He joined the Kidney Research Institute when the Kidney Research Institute was established. Uh, and so he stepped down early and decided to retire. Uh, and we want to welcome Andy Hufnagel from Lab Medicine, who has taken over as the new director of the lab at the KRI. And Andy is not going to be working alone. He has a team that he's brought with him. Uh, that's Dell, Matt, and Michelle that are going to be supporting him. Uh, and a lot of the work that we will we have done in the past and moving forward will do is, is in partnership with Andy. Not only that, we have a, a tremendous pool of talented research coordinators. Um, I'm missing one picture, but collectively these are 21 people uh, that are spread across the KRI, the transplant, the VA, uh, that are the frontline workers. And may I say frontline workers that were not considered frontline early in COVID pandemic. So just, just uh, this is, uh, they're in the trenches with the patients, uh, recruiting for studies, and our studies are successful for the work they do. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to Lori, who got appointed as the clinical research manager uh, of the Kidney Research Institute. Um, and I've worked with Lori for all the 10 years that I've been here, and uh, I couldn't do what I do without Lori's support. So thank you, Lori. We have six program managers uh, that are spread across uh, uh, including the transplant, uh, the Cancer Transplant uh, Institute, that's Barbara, and then Ernie that supports us with IRB, and then Ashwina, Natalia, Brandon, and Jennifer uh, with studies of the KRI that are managing all of the work that we do. And we have, we are unique actually among divisions of nephrology to have as rich a data analytic team as we have uh, with Leela, David, and Ian. And then there's nearly two dozen people that are working in the lab, uh, in Stewart's lab and in Vino's lab that contribute tremendously to the success of the lab and the work that is done in the labs. So it would be, un it would be incomplete for me to say that we are successful and acknowledge the work the investigators are doing without saying that we are doing this with 21 research coordinators, six program managers, nearly 30 people working in the labs at SLU and KRI, three data analysts, three grant management personnel uh, within the admin team within the division, uh, and they are the backbone that allow us to succeed in what we do. And most importantly, I want to acknowledge the support of Northwest Kidney Center. Uh, it, our success would not be possible without the support we get from the Northwest Kidney Centers. Uh, over the last 15 years, they've 
provided us with over $30 million for research for both the Kidney Research Institute and the Center for Dialysis Innovation. Uh, the support as important, the financial support as important as it is, it is also uh, the infrastructure from within the dialysis units that allow us to recruit participants for our studies, uh, which is unmatched. The, the setup that we have is unmatched um, to any place else in the country. So thank you to NKC as well. I, I, I don't want to finish the scholarly part without just talking briefly about C. Jason. Uh, you know, the University of Washington has been the home of C. Jason for the last six years. We've been asked to actually extend our term by another year. So we'll just go on till 2023 December. Um, Ian DeBoer is the, uh, is the deputy editor for the journal. Leela is a statistical editor for the journal. Uh, we have a large team of people, and we have reviewed collectively almost 10,000 papers already. We clearly will exceed 10,000 papers by the time that we, we, we would be done. <clears throat> the thing I'm most proud of is the rigor that we've brought. We've brought rigor in science that is published, rigor in data presentation, quality of images, rigor in nomenclature. Uh, and a lot of the recognition that we've gotten is because of the innovations that we've had with the patient voice, the visual abstracts, the podcast, research letters, perspectives, series, trainees of the year, and trainee peer review, where over half the programs in the United States and Canada are a part of the peer review program. Um, and this graph speaks for itself. Impact factor is a flawed metric. Um, having recognized that it is a flawed metric, nevertheless, it's an important metric. And we took over in 2017. Since 2017, the impact factor has gone up 123%. Uh, so the most recent impact factor exceeds 10.671, 10 uh, which, is, which is tremendous. Uh, I'm just very grateful for the success the journal has had. Moving then on to patient care, uh, and it is care for complex and underserved. Starting off with leadership transitions, Arthur Anderson was the leader for the dialysis program up through 2021. Matt took over as the director of the program in July of this year. Um, Bessie was the, was the section head of the VA for five years. She's moved on to the dean's office. Maggie, I just want to tremendously grateful to Maggie for her leadership as the interim section head of the VA for almost a year and celebrating the appointment of Yoshio as the section head at the VA. A hard review, I, I think nine years was nine years too long. I'm happy to have stepped down uh, and delighted to have Leah be the new section head at Harborview uh, starting, uh, actually this should be November 20, 2021. She took over as interim uh, section head uh, and was just appointed as permanent section head now. So this is the clinical leadership for the division uh, with Fanula as section head at Northwest, uh, Nikolai as director of kidney and transplant, Ashley, a kidney and pancreas transplant, uh, Ashley as section head at Mond Lake, along with Matt, Leah, and Yoshio. So our primary homes are three. Uh, we provide clinical care primarily centrally at the VA, at Mond Lake, and at Herberview. Um, and if you think about the inpatient services, there are seven inpatient services that we have at three hospitals. And across three hospitals, if you estimate, we provided nearly 15,000 dialysis treatments. This includes the outpatient dialysis at the RDU, in addition to the, at the VA, in addition to the inpatient dialysis treatments. And we perform between 160 to 170 kidney biopsies every year. But the one thing that I want to point out, and I've heard this twice in the last two weeks, that clinical nephrology is primarily an outpatient specialty. And that may not be evident to our trainees that spend so much time on the inpatient setting, that primarily most of the work that we do is in an outpatient setting. And so what do we do in an outpatient setting? We, in this past 12 months, ending June of this year, we had nearly 25,000 outpatient visits between the three sites, including dialysis at the the division has at least 13 subspecialty clinics or programs or faculty expertise other than general nephrology and transplant. And I, I can just read this. There's glomerular disease clinic, diabetes clinic, home dialysis, hypertension,
kidney genetics, kidney heart, kidney liver, kidney supportive care, low GFR clinic at the VA, onconephrology, PEDS adult transplant transition, stone transplant cancer. It's very innovative, very but also very complex that is consistent with our academic mission in providing care to the complex as well as the underserved populations. Uh, it is not simply, and you know, one of the things that I, it is often lost, that it is that we are based on those three primary sites where we provide inpatient care. A lot of the care that we provide in the ambulatory setting is off-site. Uh, and I'll start with the dialysis program. As you can see, uh, the circles are the ones where all the units that we go, and we have 13 people, is it uh, uh, 13 people that go actually drive to the dialysis units to see patients in those units to deliver care. We have the Stone Clinic that is on the Northwest campus. Fanula has been providing care for a long time. Laura is a partner with her now to provide that care. Uh, we have uh, Chris goes to the Fred Hutch Cancer Center uh, and has a cancer transplant clinic, uh, which is a very innovative concept that is very successful. We have Nan goes to the diabetes clinic embedded in the Diabetes Institute that is based out of South Lake Union. And at the VA, we have the American Lake VA, uh, where Yoshio and Anne primarily, but also Rudy, uh, drive and provide care. And, and from what I've heard from Yoshio, that the VA may need to expand further, say to Everett, to provide offsite care moving forward. So we have additional outreach, and that additional outreach takes multiple forms. We talked about telehealth. We're doing over 300 telehealth visits every month. Uh, we have e-consults, uh, and the e-consults are overseen between Harborview and Montlake by Raymond. Uh, I don't think there's anyone in the division more experienced in e-consults than Yoshio. Yoshio has done them in many different settings. He did, it the, he did it when he was at Harborview. He's doing it when he was at the VA, and he also brings the experience for the one year that he was in private practice. Uh, and then we have the VA Echo, which is a different template but Steve leads the VA ECHO program. So we have a lot of outreach. We have off-site care, but we have additional outreach that allows us to reach larger populations to deliver care that we are very good in providing. Our clinicians are recognized for clinical excellence. Seattle Met recognizes Leah every year for the last 500 years. Uh, so she's always on the list. Uh, and then the Seattle Magazine this year recognized three of our uh, nephrologists. In addition to Liakim Muzinski and Nikolai Leka, were also identified as top nephrologists in the Seattle area by Seattle Magazine. So our nephrology care is on site and off site, in person and remote. Um, but we always have to be on the lookout in terms of what are our opportunities to expand our academic mission. It is with that in mind, I had asked uh, Ashley to look at the clinical footprint work group, and he worked with Fanula, Matt, and Kerry uh, to project opportunities for the future. And I'm just listing some of them. This is not that we have committed to them, but this could be coming in the future. Uh, I mean, like close to my heart is increasing use of home dialysis. We want to talk about hypertension clinic at Montlake. We have to expand our presence in the Diabetes Institute. We may have to establish inpatient and outpatient care at Northwest. And then the Eastside Specialty Clinic is seeing its expansion, and they've been talking to us as well about that. None of this is committed, other than, say, expanding presence in Diabetes Institute. Um, but these are things, some of the things that came out of the Footprint work group. Moving on to medical education, uh, which is training our future physicians. Uh, we were able to celebrate in person our graduating fellows. They graduated, but was it really a goodbye? I mean, Alex is not far in Portland. Francis is doing a research training. Uh, Jasleen is at Valley. Laura is our faculty. Amol is doing a third year of training in home dialysis and policy. Uh, so happy to have them all close uh, in within UW or close to UW. We have uh, 10 uh, ACGME fellows. I mean, I think uh, 
it's fair to say that we have a very competitive fellowship program uh, and we attract the best and the brightest. Uh, and so it's a pleasure to have them all as a part of our fellowship team. Uh, and they have really settled in um, the Seattle area. I mean, like they party more than anyone I know. And I part of me felt like a creep looking at the Twitter feed to look at all of these pictures to collate them for this talk. Um, but um, I'm glad to see that there's, our, our new fellows are settling down, making friendships in Seattle uh, and uh, enriching our program the way they do. Uh, we have reorganized uh, our nephrology education portfolio uh, because it is complex, it is wide, uh, and it was substantially strained. Pleased to have Nisha uh, as the inaugural director for nephrology education for both clinical and research uh, education with the overarching goal of coordinating efforts in education that we have for medical students, residents, fellows, uh, pre-doctoral students and students that are making rotate that are doing rotations. We've had change in our fellowship leadership. Uh, we've had uh, Yoshio chain uh, step down as program director for five years. Carrie is the new program director. Nisha was associate program director for eight years, uh, and now it's Sarah Struthers that is the program director. I'll let you decide whether transition was a step up or a step down. Uh, so we have. So, but welcome, Carrie. Uh, delighted for you to be the leader of the fellowship program. We've had Jen Perez, who was the fellowship coordinator, that stepped down, uh, and she, uh, Danielle, is supporting the fellowship program in an interim role. Um, I want to thank Matt, Carrie, and Sarah for their work in for being the resident and student coordinator for the respective sites. Uh, we have now one person leading the efforts, and that would be Nan. And so we have this education team that is very, actually, that's very large. It's the largest education team we've had. Uh, we've had eight, we are eight people that meets quarterly uh, in terms of coordinating all of the efforts in, in different portfolios uh, for the residents, for the students, for the transplant, for uh, our, and any other new initiatives that we may have. And I'll talk more about this in terms of the work that they're doing. We have many outstanding educators, and every year we identify one of them, the fellows identify one of them uh, and award them. Uh, the F Teacher of the Year in 2020 21 was Yoshio Hall, uh, and Abal was the Educator of the Year for this year. Uh, and then he joins the panel, and you know, the picture speaks uh, uh, for itself. As you can see, for the last 10 years, people that have been recognized uh, as the Teacher of the Year by the fellows. Uh, just so the new fellows may know and the new faculty may know that Leah bowed out from consideration from the last time that she was recognized in 2017. Uh, and that's why Leah is just on the top and, no, and not since then. Uh, one of the things that I'm very particularly proud of that our program is responsive to trainee feedback. And, you know, uh, I think a lot of the credit goes to the fellowship program to organizing a retreat every year. Uh, these are pictures from the retreat, the Horticulture Center from earlier this year from the fellows. Uh, our program provides a rich menu of training opportunities that we have further expand, that we're working on expanding to introduce the focus curriculum. Again, shamelessly showing something published in CJSON, uh, recognizing there are gaps in training in focus around the country. Uh, so 74% of programs reported pr development, that program is in development, or they have an interest in creating a curriculum, and we have that. Uh, and David is working with Steve uh, to develop a curriculum for POCUS for our fellows so that we should have, by the time the new group starts in 20, like perhaps this year we're going to get started, but a mature curriculum by July of next year uh, for our trainees. I just want to spe specifically also acknowledge Sarah. Uh, you know, she is uh, very experienced in doing POCUS and she's already providing hands on training to the trainees when they're at the VA. Um, and the the goal for what Steve and David are doing would be to further build on what is already happening within the institution. Again, our educational mission is supported with the Northwest Kidney Centers for decades. Uh, and I, I don't, we don't even have written records, but they go back to the, from the, to the early 70s uh, that a fellowship program is supported by the Northwest Kidney Centers. Uh, we couldn't have the group of fellows we have without their support. And this year, they're supporting two ACGME fellows one research fellow and one Peckham fellow. 
Now, we're not working in isolation. You know, we have, um, we are a division in the Department of Medicine, uh, and the Department of Medicine has completed a strategic plan that has four elements to it, is that we want to lead in innovation of patient care delivery and research, that we nurture a supportive, collaborative culture where equity, diversity, and inclusion are at the center, invest in our trainees, staff, and faculty, and elevate and sustain excellence in teaching. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about these uh, 11 things very quickly as we go along and how they interface with the departmental strategic plan. I think one of the major changes that has happened in our specialty is the revolutionary change uh, in DKD therapeutics. I think there is nothing that has had more change than in the treatment of diabetic kidney disease. Uh, in 2019, the Credence trial was published with canagliflozin and renal outcomes in type 2 diabetes and nephropathy. Uh, and people use the word the flozinators, the nephrologists are the new flozinators. Um, we have the non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, the Fidelio DKD study that was published and we're learning how to integrate MRAs with ozons for kidney care. Uh, and then we have the GLP-1 agonist, the leader trial, that, uh, for example, that was published a few years ago in, in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and we have to integrate the GLP receptor and, uh, agonist for glycemic management. Uh, I think Ian wrote the editorial that went with the leader trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. We have a very robust portfolio of research in diabetic kidney disease at University of Washington. Uh, Ian, of course, Kathy Tuttle in Spokane, Christine has an interest in it, and Nan is engaging increasingly in research in diabetic kidney disease. Uh, outside the Division of Nephrology, Charlie Alpers has done tremendous work in the field, and of course, people in endocrinology, it's Nicole, Subu, and Earl, uh, that are nationally, internationally recognized for the work that they're doing, and are tremendous partners to, the, to us within nephrology uh, to be able to do what we do. Ian has been the leader of the KDGO Clinical Practice Guidelines, uh, and members of the expert group have included Kathy and Tammy Sadesky. She's actually a patient, uh, and she's the patient voice from within Seattle in this international group that has come up with guidelines. And I don't know if this has come out yet or not. Uh, there is a 2022 update to the KDGO Guidelines that is coming, led also by Ian and Peter Rossing in Denmark. So uh, needless to say, DKD treatment has been revolutionized. We are an active participants in leading the effort in multiple ways. And we have diabetes nephrology care embedded in the Diabetes Institute. And I'm fairly certain that we'll add at least one more nephrologist by July 2023 because of the tremendous need there. What about technological innovations in dialysis? Um, the future will include wearables and implantables. It is not going to be, there's a lot of interest in home, of course, uh, but I think future will include wearables and implantables in the Center for Dialysis Innovation, led by Jonathan and Buddy, supported by the Northwest Kidney Centers, has been doing tremendous work in this regard. Uh, and they have a prototype that they have developed of a dialysis machine that could be on a, in a backpack, uh, and they call it active, ambulatory kidney to improve vitality. Uh, that has been widely recognized. Kidney X is a collaboration between ASN and CMS, uh, and it received uh, a phase one finalist award in 2019. A vascular graft that they're developing was a winner in 2020, and they got another prize in 2021. Uh, just a testament to the quality of the work that is happening. There will be a wearable kidney that will come out of the University of Washington led by the Center of Dialysis mm -hmm. Innovation. The question, the question is when? and it's gonna be sooner than later. Uh, they've also gotten support from the Washington Research Foundation, as well as the Innovation Fund from the NKI. And then Seattle is the home for the IDS conference, which brings together innovators of wearable, portable, and implantable dialysis technologies once a year. And those of you that have not attended it, I encourage you to attend it in this coming year and years to come. Moving towards precision medicine, that is another movement that is happening in our field. Uh, I want to just spend a minute talking about rebuilding a kidney. Uh, work that is happening in the University of Washington is happening on two fronts. One is rebuilding a kidney, which is kidney regeneration and repair. And this is a consortium of investigators 
that are working to isolate, expand, and differentiate cell types, and then integrate them into complex structures that will replicate kidney function, essentially creating the kidney we have, uh, and not, a dial not a technological device like dialysis. And Stuart is leading efforts for podocyte repair and regeneration, along with his team of Jim Roberts, Ollie Vesley, and Bino Friedman, that are doing the work on rebuilding a kidney consortium. A lot of progress is being made <clears throat> in that regard. The second work that is also important, that is equally important, is the KPMP. And we are the central hub for KPMP that is taking a different approach than rebuilding a kidney. And where in people that have kidney disease from diabetes, hypertension, or AKI, they are doing research biopsies effectively to identify cell to subphenotype diseases, but also to identify essentially cellular molecular signatures that could then result in directed therapies towards that. A lot of progress has been made in oncology in this regard, and the hope is that KPMP will make progress in this regard. It just got renewed for another five years, uh, and a lot of innovative, innovative work is going to come out of the KPMP that is going to that is going to be influential internationally work that is coming out of the University of Washington. <clears throat> Person-centered care. I mean, like the way I like to think about person-centered care is moving from chasing numerical targets to treating the whole person. And person is a better word in this context than patient. Patient is a medical term. Person is the whole person. Um, and I'm just going to give you some examples of the work that is happening in this area, starting with the work that Matt's done. Um, those of you that work in dialysis know that people on in-center hemodialysis are given a survey twice a year to measure their experience of care. Uh, no such survey exists for home dialysis. And, and the work that Matt's done the last four or five years has come up with one, the only such instrument for people on home dialysis for us to measure their experience with care. Uh, and is working now with uh, NQF and CMS for adoption nationwide. I want to acknowledge the community-based supportive care program housed at NKC that is led by Dan. It was established in April 2017. It's available to all patients at Northwest Kidney Centers. It, so not just UW patients, but everyone. And it evaluates and provides supportive care in dialysis units or via telemedicine or in people's home. And since the inception of the program, it has served over 400 patients to date. In 2020, it's extended to provide concurrent care. That's a big area of unmet need in end of life care that they've been able to bridge. Ongoing dialysis while in hospice and access to hospice end of life in patients under this program is twice the national rate and length of stay in hospice is five times longer, which is extremely important. We have three clinical trials that are ongoing for managing symptoms in people on hemodialysis. Uh, one is targeting chronic insomnia, which is actually experienced by 50% of people on dialysis. The second is in chronic pain. Uh, it's a, it is gonna be one of the largest studies in dialysis that is ongoing, uh, enrolling 640 patients in nationally, uh, the intervention there is pain coping skills treatment. And then Concord, which is for treating depression in people with chronic kidney disease. Essentially, improving symptoms is, it, it is a step beyond chasing numerical targets and is an important part of the care we deliver. I want to point out Susan has just gotten a VA Merit Award uh, to develop a conservative care pathway uh, delivered at home. Uh, and it's a four-year randomized pilot trial uh, using ethnographic research methods that is going to compare experiences of conservatively managed patients versus usual care. Um, conservative care is more mature as the way of delivering care in, say, the UK and Australia. It's not the case in the United States. I, I think Susan is leading the way, working at the VA nationally. and, and she, as a part of that is established a low GFR clinic at the VA where people 
that have not been under the care of a nephrologist that have a low GFR will be referred such that they are supported in making treatment decisions that are best for them. And finally, uh, one way to celebrate person-centered care is to honor Bill Peckham, uh, who was the strongest voice in patient advocacy in our community nationwide and internationally. Thanks to all of the donors and the first holder of the endowed fund is Anne that I pointed out earlier in my presentation. Moving on to incorporating patient voice, which is a further extension of the principle of no decision about me without me. This is, uh, this is a phrase that patients often use that, how can you make decisions that affect my care without me as a part of the conversation? And that includes research. Um, and the Kidney Research Institute was a leader in this regard by establishing a patient advisory committee as far ago as 2016. I want to acknowledge all of the work that Glenda is doing. Many of you know Glenda. Glenda is a patient. Uh, she is the Director of External Relations and Patient Engagement at the KRI and the CDI. Um, she is, as I said, also a partner with the CDI in in the patient voice as well as patient outreach. She is a part of the Kidney Precision Medicine Project, lending a patient voice there. She's a part of Apollo, which is APOL1 Long-Term Kidney Transplantation Outcomes Consortium. She is a part of the Kidney Health Initiatives. And she was a part of the NKF ASN Task Force for Race and Reporting EGFR. She's everywhere. Uh, but she's a, she's a powerful advocate for patients working within the KRI and the CDI, supporting and advocating for patients and their needs to be considered in the research we do. We have the patient voice. Uh, I, I just want to uh, shout, like the work that we do at CJSON was the first journal to actually have an article written by patients. We were the first journal to have identified three patients as editors. And these patients help us identify other patients to write opinion pieces on research we publish. And since the inception of the program, we've had over 60 patients have authored editorials in CJSON. And I encourage you to read at least one or two of these articles uh, to understand the value patients bring in lending their uh, opinions on research and how that makes research better. Uh, patient advisors or advisory committees on our routine, we have that for Center for Dialysis Innovation uh, and uh, Chris in the Center for Innovations in Cancer and Transplant has also a patient advisory group and there are many investigator initiated studies at the KRI that have patients as well and then a lot of scholarly work is coming out of the University of Washington uh, as you can see uh, from the KPMP for example led by Kate and then Kate Kathy Tuttle uh, communicating patient priorities with science and engagement. Moving then on to public policy sh shaping nephrology care, acknowledge that Sarah and Suzanne are member of the ASN Quality Committee. So they're leaders in policy nationwide. Um, the big policy change that we are navigating is advancing American kidney health. I'm not gonna go through the details of every component uh, that is a part of advancing American kidney health. I'm gonna highlight two things. There is a focus on expanding home dialysis and transplant for patients with kidney failure. Uh, home dialysis, of course, close to my heart. Uh, and I started my career at a time when home dialysis use was declining. Uh, and I always re remember this editorial that I wrote in 2006, where I said peritoneal dialysis penetration in the United States marched towards the fringes because it was becoming less and less used for treating kidney failure. And how things have changed nationwide uh, as you can see, the number of people that are doing, this is home dialysis, uh, as far ago as 2019 was over 60,000 people. Uh, and I think uh, we are in 2022, that number now is closer to 70,000 people, which is one of the largest population of home dialysis worldwide. And so use of home dialysis is expected to continue, perhaps further accelerate. Uh, there is one part of clinical care where most of our faculty are involved, and that is home dialysis. And this is uh, a group of people that have at least one patient on home dialysis, that are involved in dialysis care broadly. And many of them have patients that do home dialysis as well. 
uh, if you look at the use of peritoneal dialysis within UW medicine relative to our community, we do better than the community. So this is, this is NKC as an average. This is the UW practice. It's labeled Orb Review, but it includes all of UW. As you can see, so a larger proportion of our patients dialyze at home than dialyze, than community, in a community at large. Um, I also want to shout, a shout out to uh, Matt for his leadership of this quarterly West Coast Journal Club. Uh, there were over 30 people, a mole presented uh, at this journal club. It's held four times in a year, uh, and it's led by Matt and Jenny. Uh, Jenny is at Harbor UCLA, where I used to be. Uh, and this is uh, one of the challenges in home dialysis education is that at any given institution, there is not a critical mass. In creating this West Coast Journal Club, there is then a critical mass of people that are experts in home dialysis. There's a forum for people to gather for that education to happen. Uh, and I think it's an innovative idea uh, and uh, we are leading the effort. We are part of leading the effort in the West Coast. A lot of work, we are well positioned then to leverage the policy change that is coming in growing home dialysis. We have a very successful transplant program. The number of transplants that are done at the University of Washington have nearly doubled in the last 10 years. Uh, and a lot of the growth that is gonna happen in the future is gonna be in living kidney donation. Um, not only is it a high volume program, it's a high quality program. This is from the UNOS data, for example, that if you are on um, a waiting list at the University of Washington, your ability to get a transplant is, your probability of getting a transplant is higher than if you were elsewhere. This is observed, this is expected, such that there's a 50% higher likelihood of getting a transplantation. Nikolai tells me it is to do with how complete the workup of people is that are on the list, such that when a kidney becomes available, the kidney is able to be transplanted. Um, in addition, the graft survival rate, as you can see, uh, the, the graft failure is so much lower than what is expected, such that we, um, we do exceedingly well in terms of graft outcomes as well. So we're very well positioned uh, to lead this effort in increase in transplant that is gonna come because of public policy. We've added two members to the transplant team, Daniel and Jessica, uh, such that we have a robust group of people that are working to improve transplant care in our community. Transitioning then to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, start by acknowledging Bessie, who's the Vice Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Very proud of her leadership within the institution for all of the work that she does in advancing health equity as well as diversity and inclusion. This is the first time we've had departmental statistics um, to uh, compare the demographics of people within nephrology uh, to the medicine department at large. Uh, as not surprising, the single most common demographic group by race is uh, people that identify themselves as white, uh, followed by Asian. Uh, we have more people that identify them as Asian than uh, the department at large. Uh, one thing I want a, a note of caution when looking at these data is that 30% of people department-wide do not either share the data or don't want to share the data. Uh, and so we don't know what the the racial demographics of these individuals are, this is a much smaller proportion within nephrology. Um, so just a word of caution. We have more men than women. That is also something that we've been aware of. Uh, and we've been at, we are, our hope is to enhance equity overall in terms of appointment as members of the faculty. So that's starting with a diverse workforce. And I think the first thing I wanna point out is that we are vested in ensuring that we have a diverse workforce. And diversity takes many forms. And I want to start with a, a support that uh, Jonathan and Glenda were able to get from the Mount Baker Foundation. Uh, Mount Baker Foundation is the foundation up north that provides charitable support. Uh, and they have pledged a gift of $100,000 a year for 10 years to help us diversify our workforce. Um, and uh, the goal is to increase diversity in research specifically and to support the recruitment and retention of grad students, fellows, and postdocs. 
The NIH definition of underrepresented in research is broad. It includes identity by race, but it also includes individuals with disabilities, individuals with from disadvantaged backgrounds, and women from above backgrounds at grad level or beyond. And so Ian, as the director of the KRI, is leading effort to create a system supported by this group of individuals uh, to come up with uh, programs within the division that are directed at fellows, residents, and medical students. And if you have any ideas that you want to share with them, please do. A shout out to the ASN that has provided a loan mitigation pilot program. It provides $50,000 in loan relief to people that are underrepresented in medicine by race. Uh, one of our fellows, Justin, is a recipient of uh, this award from ASN. Uh, Justin has um, been a loud voice advocating for equity, diversity, and inclusion from the time that he was a resident, at least. And I just want to point out that he uh, was invited to talk to uh, this Federation of State Medical Boards, that 50 state medical boards that set policies. Uh, and Justin was one of the speakers uh, talking about queer, queer, I cannot pronounce that, but pardon my Indian heritage, uh, visibility in medicine. And then he was identified as one of the five WebMD heroes. So uh, acknowledging all of the work that Justin is doing in advocating for equity, diversity, and inclusion. Inclusive workforce, um, I want to talk a little bit about women in nephrology. Uh, earlier this month, I, I was surprised actually to read this, uh, but it is what it is. 20% of female faculty at UW have experienced gender-based discrimination or harassment. Um, and so uh, we have Sarah and Laura that are leading the effort now uh, for the group that established by Nisha on women in nephrology uh, and our women faculty fellows and people and women nephrologists in the community meet regularly uh, hopefully it provides a platform for them to share issues that are important for them for their success uh, professionally and personally. We are also a part of the Bias Navigator program. Uh, and so it, you can, anyone that experiences bias within nephrology is a part of that pilot to contact a navigator. And then in terms of inclusion, that will be one of the primary focus for the divisional faculty retreat in October. Um, and then equitable treatment, I look at it two parts, like there's the equitable treatment for members of the division, there should be equity and opportunities for professional growth and compensation, and for equitable delivery of healthcare. And I just want to acknowledge you, Harn, who's a member of the Healthcare Justice Committee of the ASN, uh, and a passionate advocate for healthcare equity. And so thank you for all that you do and making this better in what we do. Climate change, it is, uh, people have called it the existential threat. Um, and the ASN came out with a statement on climate change with three goals. To support people with kidney disease survive climate change, diminish the contribution of kidney care to climate change. Think about dialysis, how much water we use, how much electricity do we use. Um, and advocate for public policy to address climate change as a contributor to kidney health. And I want to acknowledge here, Sarah, along with Kate, that have been a part of this effort from ASN and the article that they wrote recently in Jason on policy and kidney community engagement to advance towards greener kidney care. This is something we cannot ignore. This is something we have to focus on, something we have to acknowledge as we develop new treatments and technologies. Future, I I'm promise I have, I'm coming to a close. Um, Future nephrology workforce. Um, we know that interest in training in nephrology is declining. It is a stunning statistic that up to 41% of positions in nephrology nationwide are filled in post-match scramble. Uh, I see Dr. Hall, I'm sure he can tell me that five for five years we've not needed to scramble, um, but up to 41% of positions are filled in post-match scramble. So it is incumbent upon us to increase interest in nephrology in trainees that are at the University of Washington. That is part of the reason why we established this new position for director for nephrology education and delighted to have Nisha be in that role. Uh, and for Nan to be the new resident student coordinator. 
a lot of the work has been done already that had been led by Sarah and by uh, Sarah led the effort supported by Carrie and by Matt in enhancing nephrology education in multiple settings, uh, whether it was establishing an intern half day, nephrology report, chief of medicine rounds, m and other teaching conferences. New initiatives that are ongoing are near peer mentoring program for UW students and residents. It is essentially would be say a fellow that is a mentor then to a resident that has an interest in nephrology. Divisional support for URM students and residents from other institutions. Participating in the internal medicine physician scientist learning pathway. And to enhance clinical experience, which is site specific, for example, offering the opportunity to be a part of the KLP and the KHS experience at Montlake. We have more residents with interest in nephrology today than I've seen in the 10 years that I've been here. And that is a result of all the efforts faculty have done in ensuring that that happens. Clinical subspecialization, this is the, uh, this is, um, we already, there is a lot of interest nationwide in developing pathways to allow nephrologists to become subspecialists. It's very complicated. ASN, uh, it, it is, I, I've delved into the details and it's extremely complicated. Uh, you know, even though we, we recognize transplant as a subspecialty, the ACGME actually does not recognize transplant as a subspecialty. It requires at least 3,000 practitioners for that specialty to be a subspecialty. There are not even 1,000 transplant nephrologists nationwide, like some 900 transplant nephrologists nationwide. Um, so nephrology subspecialty actually is overseen by AST and not by ACGME. We have a transplant fellowship. Yuharn is the program director. We have Danny, who's the um, who's a fellow, and the accreditation, as I said, by, is by AST. Nikolai has been the chair. Yuharn is a member of the committee, uh, which is very influential in setting standards for transplantation nationwide. Um, this year, we have the Peckham Fellowship, supported by the Northwest Kidney Centers, focused on home dialysis and policy. Amol is the inaugural Peckham Fellow, uh, and Nisha and Matt are the ones that are leading the effort in educating Amol in it being a productive year for him. Um, other than that, we don't have any formal tracks. We allow people to chart their own way and divisional support as possible on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, this is an article again in C. Jason uh, on, uh, on critical care nephrology. Uh, we don't have that pathway. The way it works right now is you do two years of nephrology, one year of critical care, and that's how you become a critical care nephrologist. There is not an integrated training program. There's been advocacy for introducing nephrocardiology, uh, and we have a kidney heart program. We've published on our experience, whether or not that evolves as a subspecialty, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, we do have three people that are trained subspecialists within the division. Dan has done a year in palliative care. Sarah, I just pointed out, has done a year in critical care. Sorry, palliative care for Dan, critical care for Sarah, and glomerular diseases for, um, uh, for Abal. Finally, training nephrology researchers for tomorrow. Uh, this is critically important, important to me, important in the way we make investments for the future. Um, our research training grant is in its 39th year of continuous funding from the NIH. Stuart was the director of the um, T32 program for 15 years. Jonathan joined as a, as a co-PI in 2014 by all measures, it's been very successful. And now the leaders of the T32 are Nisha and Brian. In these, I look back 10 years, we've had 16 adult nephrology fellows that have been supported by the T32 grant in the last 10 years. If you look at this, four of our fellows have actually made a T to K transition. Some of you may know Bob Roshan Ravan. He now has two R01s working at UC Davis. Matt, Susan and Kate. Kate got a perfect 10 on a K23 application and is now a new faculty member. So we have four of our adult nephrology fellows from 16 that have made this TDK transition. The T32 provides support for two years. There is this one to three years in addition that it takes people in making the transition from a T32 to getting what we call as a career development award. 
And that's a vulnerable period for people. And that is where a lot of our trainees drop off because there is no opportunity for support. Our trainees have done exceedingly well in getting additional support, starting with Simon. He got an F32 grant. He got a perfect 10 uh, on the F32. Uh, and he's working his way towards a career development grant. Christine is supported by the American Kidney Fund. American Kidney Fund gives two awards every year. And one of the two was Christine. So, so proud of what they have accomplished. The ASN gives Ben Lips Award, gives five awards every year. Two of them this year, Mike Granda and Ben Lidgard, were from UW. Two out of five, 40% of the recipients this year were from UW, our trainees, so proud of their accomplishments. So of the 16 individuals that have been supported by the T32 over the last 10 years, um, nationally, if you look, a quarter of T32 trainees get subsequent grant support. We've had four that have made a TTK transition. We have four of our trainees that have succeeded in getting additional funding to continue towards the CDA. And Francis is still currently on the T32. So we have a very successful track record. Our hope is for it to continue to uh, succeed in supporting trainees to have the career that they would like to have. So even though our, our just, just I just gloated how our trainees have been so successful in getting this additional support, we recognize that there are individuals that may need support from within the institution. And as a part of that, we've started a bridge funding program that will provide partial or complete salary support to one trainee for one year within nephrology. And so it needs to be an adult nephrology trainee who has completed two years of research training and who's working towards a career development grant. And uh, that is in addition to what the department provides, the Chair of Medicine Scholar Award that Kate got and this DOM Diversity Academic Scholars Award. We've also starting a small grants program that will provide trainees with five grants of up to $5,000 each every year. Again, this is going to be for you, anybody who's working with a UW nephrology faculty member. It doesn't have to be a fellow. This could be a medical student, a resident, a fellow, an acting instructor, a PhD student, or a pre-doctoral student. Uh, anyone would be eligible to apply. Um, and there are these allowable expenses that we have. Um, I'm on my last two slides. I just want to acknowledge the institutional leadership of research training. So Brian, so not only do we provide training to our trainees within nephrology, we provide trainees to a much larger group of individuals outside nephrology. So Brian runs this course for all of Department of Medicine and Department of Pediatrics, supported by Leela and David in teaching research methods to young investigators. Nisha and Brian are working on this U2C TL1 that'll impact nephrology, urology, and benign hematology. And we hosted just the fourth nephrology fellow research uh, uh, retreat where we had 16 attendees, eight speakers, and the agenda actually was led by our trainees. Simon uh, and Christine led the effort in putting together the research retreat this year. So wrapping up, uh, this is my last slide. I've said a lot, I've talked for a long time, uh, and I'm uh, just, this is just showing the divisional faculty uh, and just Thank you for all that you do. Uh, it is the people that make us succeed in achieving the academic mission that we have.